Hello and welcome to worship for this February the 3rd and 4th of 2024. My name is Susan Shepherd and I serve the pastoral charge of Bell Island and Portugal Cove here in Newfoundland and Labrador. The presence of creativity God fills the places in which we gather. The whole earth is full of God's glory. So let us celebrate the richness and diversity of life. We light this candle today to recognize the energy that allows life to occur. The energy of atoms fusion, fusing, the energy of photosynthesis, the energy of primitive metabolism still active in our cells today, the energy of campfires, labor and growth, and the energy of our community. For thousands of years, indigenous people have lived in this land on their own country. Their relationship with the land is at the center of their lives. And we acknowledge the Beothic and Mi'kmaq people of this island and the Innu and Inuit people of Labrador and their stewardship of these lands throughout the ages. As settlers in these lands, we acknowledge our role in past and present wrongs. We mourn the laughter silenced and the lives robbed and not recorded. We will continue to learn and to do our part to live into the ways of reconciliation. We also endeavor to make this a safe time and place for all people to worship, regardless of racial or cultural background, creed, age, ability, nationality, economic status, sexual orientation, or gender identity. And please join me in our opening prayer. Holy One, you stretch out the heavens like a curtain and spread them like a tent to live in. You determine the number of stars and give to all of them their names. And yet, as you are always among us and within us, in every breath, in every heartbeat, in every moment, you beckon to us from every snowflake and raindrop, from sunshine and shadow, from crocus and blue jay, from every person we meet. As we come to know ourselves, help us to remember that you call us to gather in your name. Amen. Our first song is Who is My Mother? Also known as Kindred in Spirit through Jesus Christ. And it's number 178 in more voices. Who is my mother? Who is my brother? All those who gather round Jesus Christ. Spirit-born people, born from the gospel, sit at the table round Jesus Christ. Differently abled, differently labeled, widen the circle round Jesus Christ. Crutches and stigmas, cultures and enigmas, all come together round Jesus Christ. Love will relate us, color or status, can't segregate us round Jesus Christ. Family failings, human derailings, all are accepted round Jesus Christ. Bound by one vision, met for one mission, we claim each other round Jesus Christ. Here is my mother, here is my brother, kindred in spirit through Jesus Christ. Now whether you take what is written in the Bible as fact, metaphor, myth, or story, listen to these words now for the meaning they hold for you on this day. And the first reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 16. 16 to 23. Still, I want it made clear that I've never gotten anything out of this for myself and that I'm not writing now to get something. 
I'd rather die than give anyone ammunition to discredit me or question my motives. If I proclaim the message, it's not to get something out of it for myself. I'm compelled to do it and doomed if I don't. If this was my own idea of just another way to make a living, I'd expect some pay. But since it's not my idea, but something solemnly entrusted to me, why would I expect to get paid? So am I getting anything out of it? Yes. As a matter of fact, the pleasure of proclaiming the message at no cost to you. You don't even have to pay my expenses. Even though I'm free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I have voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to reach a wide range of people, religious, non-religious, meticulous moralist, loose living immoralist, the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. I didn't take on my way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ, but I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. I've become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. I did all this because of the message. I didn't just want to talk about it. I wanted to be in on it. Now the Gospel reading comes from Mark chapter 1 verses 29 through 39. And it's continuing that busy day that Jesus started last week when he cured the man with the unclean spirit in the temple. Directly after leaving the meeting place, they came to Simon and Andrew's house, accompanied by James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed, burning up with fever. They told Jesus. He went to her, took her hand, and raised her up. No sooner had the fever left than she was up and fixing dinner for them. That evening, after the sun was down, they brought sick and evil-afflicted people to him. The whole city lined up at his door. He cured their sick bodies and tormented spirits. Because the demons knew his true identity, he didn't let them say a word. While it was still night, way before dawn, he got up and went out to a secluded spot and prayed. Simon and those with him went looking for him. They found him and said, Everybody's looking for you. Jesus said, Let's go to the rest of the villages so I can preach there also. This is why I've come. He went to their meeting places all through Galilee, preaching and throwing out demons. May these words help us to learn from the past and listen for God's word today. The gospel story from Mark describes a day in the life of Jesus. He teaches, heals, and exercises some demons. He is going from dawn until well after sundown. No healing is too large and or too small for his attention, and after a few hours of sleep, he's off to a deserted place for some quiet time with himself and God to clear his mind and reconnect with his sense of mission before starting all over again. For Mark, this first day of ministry is a microcosm of Jesus' whole mission. It's quite a day. I wonder if we could keep up. And then he announces, gather your stuff, boys. We're going to visit the neighborhood villages. Let's look a little more closely at that particular day. This is the same day that Jesus had been teaching at the synagogue when the man with the unclean spirit interrupted. Jesus ordered the spirit to be quiet and to go away, which it did. And the people all wondered at his authority and started spreading the story. After synagogue, Jesus and the disciples head over to Simon's house for lunch, only to find Simon's mother-in-law sick in bed and no lunch ready. Jesus heals her, and she gets up and gets lunch for them. Now, that sounds rather sexist. Uh, the recently sick woman must get up and start getting a meal on the table. 
but considering the lesser place of women in this society, it is significant that Jesus' first act of healing, a physical illness, is of a woman in a private home. The verb which is used, diakononi, ministry, means ministry and service. The same root word that gives us the word deacon. She is the original deacon. What's more, the word diakonosis literally means to kick up the dust. This is an active, practical, on the move, change the world sort of work. In short, she is lifted up to serve. She is freed for ministry to kick up some dust and get things done. On the most literal level, it does mean she got up and got lunch for everybody. But it also means to do ministry and is more likely a reference to her choice to continue to serve Jesus' ministry in the future. Next in the day's agenda is to heal all of those who came to Simon and Andrew's house at sundown who were sick or possessed with demons. Why did they wait until sundown to bring the sick and possessed? Well, the Sabbath ended at sundown on Saturday, and then work could begin again. It's odd that no one calls Jesus out for healing the man with the unclean spirit on the Sabbath in the synagogue. And the healing of Simon's mother-in-law took place in a private home and therefore was witnessed by few. Healing people on the Sabbath will later be one of the charges that the Pharisees use against Jesus. In his ministry of healing, Jesus uses a variety of healing methods. Touch, spoken word, prayer, and distance healing, spit and mud, exorcism, and personal challenge. His, he recognized the uniqueness of each person and used whatever means would be most helpful to the person who stood before him. Jesus asked questions of persons in need of wholeness, such as, what do you want me to do for you? Or, do you want to be healed? He recognized that wholeness cannot be coerced, but must be accepted and embraced consciously or unconsciously at the right time and place. We are fortunate that Jesus did not practice, teach, or recommend only one method of healing. His healing style with an assortment of tools and practices gives us the freedom to seek healing and wholeness by whatever means are appropriate, convenient, and requested by the person in need. Followers of Jesus' way of healing can employ Western medicines, tools of surgery, medication, chemotherapy, and less traditional tools, at least in the Western world, of acupuncture, chiropractics, massage, therapeutic touch, reiki, and others. Now back to the day in the life. We don't know how long the healings of all those who came at sundown took, but I imagine it was late into the night. The next morning, Jesus is up early, before the sun. He leaves the house and finds a deserted place to pray. This is a common theme in Jesus' life, going to a deserted place to pray. In the book Jesus Today by Albert Nolan, there's a section on the spiritualities of Jesus, the first of which is silence and solitude. Nolan takes talks about the general lack of silence and solitude in our daily lives and the importance of making room for short periods of both each day to recharge our batteries, to get in touch with ourselves and with God. He says that while a week-long silent retreat once a year is great, it's not as beneficial as five minutes of silence each day. Archbishop Oscar Romero said, Spirituality is not just about hearing God in our inner life, but in the suffering of those around us, especially the poor and vulnerable. If we don't hear the cries of the poor, we may, as the prophet Amos notes, experience a famine of hearing, in hearing God's word, despite our elaborate liturgies and well-crafted sermons. In Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, 
he encourages his readers to be flexible in their presentation of the gospel and in their relationships with others. Similar to Jesus' way, many ways to heal people, many ways to heal people, there are many ways to share God's good news, and the sharing needs to mirror the needs of those being addressed. As Paul Simon wrote in The Sound of Silence, the words of the prophets are written on the subway walls and tenement halls. Pay attention to the needs of the community, the poor and the vulnerable. Then you can share the good news in actions and word. Today's gospel story marks a transition in Jesus' ministry away from Capernaum and into the towns and the countryside of Galilee. When his disciples finally find him, they tell him that people are looking for him, and he replies, Let us go into the neighboring towns. It would have been easy to stay in one place and have the people come to him. Jesus may never have ruffled the feathers of the Romans or the temple leaders if he had, but Jesus chose to go and begin the journey which would eventually take him to Jerusalem. We will soon start our annual journey towards Good Friday, and that journey is important. Modern Christian scholar Walter Wink, in an article entitled The Son of Man, wrote, We are free to go on the journey that Jesus chartered, just rather than the journey... Hang on, let's start that again. We are free to go on the journey that Jesus chartered, rather than to journey... I can't read this this morning. We are, fr we, are we are free to go on the journey that Jesus chartered, rather than to worship the journey of Jesus. We can take Jesus out of the ghetto of the churches and offer him to anyone looking for a guide to true humanity. There, I finally read it right. I think that is possible possibly what Paul was trying to get at in his letter to the Corinthians. To not confine the gospel, the good news, to one way of thought or expression. To live the good news, making it our broader community a better, more just, and compassionate place to live. We are called to go on the journey rather than to worship the journey. And let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for calling us to you from all corners of the world to come home to belong. We appreciate your love that embraces all of us. We thank you that we are all one in you. We thank you for your faithfulness and justice. Remind us that we are here to fulfill your calling to serve where there is cruelty May we model your kindness. Where there is despair, may we model your hope. Where there is anxiety, may we model your comfort. Where there is loneliness, may we, we model your presence. And where there is strife, may we model your peace. Help all we do be done for love as we make a commitment to go into the world as agents of your justice, peace. And reconciliation. And we gather our prayers together as we pray the Abba prayer which is written in the Spirit of the Lord's Prayer. God lover of us all, most holy one, help us to respond to you to create what you want for us here on earth. Give us today enough for our needs, forgive our weak and deliberate offenses, just as we must forgive others when they hurt us. Help us to resist evil and to do what is good, for we are yours, endowed with your power to make our world whole. Amen. The song is Spirit God Be Our Breath, or Embracing Change, and it's number 150 in more voices. Spirit God, be our breath, be our song. 
Blow through us, bringing strength to move on. Our world seems inward, defensive, withdrawn. Spirit God, be our song. Patient God, soothe our pride, calm our fear. Comfort us when we know you are near. We grow more certain our vision is clear. Patient God, calm our fear. Loving God, be our voice, be our prayer. Reaching out, joining hands as we share. We seek your guidance through friendship and care. Loving God, be our prayer. Spirit God, be our breath, be our song. Blow through us, bringing strength to move on. Through change, through challenge, we'll greet the new dawn. Spirit God, be our song. Well, thank you for joining us for worship today. And... Uh, I hope you're enjoying the lovely weather before it starts snowing again. The universe is much larger than our ability to comprehend, so let us go from this time together with the resolve to allow wonder, that sense of what is sacred, to find space to open up our minds and illumine our lives. And may we walk softly, speak truthfully, love gently, breathe deeply, and live wisely as we go now in peace. Amen.